In this video lesson, we're going to have a look at groups and power when it comes to social psychology. So I went to the dentist recently because I had some bad tooth pain. A couple of x-rays were taken and then the dentist broke the bad news to me. Bad tooth decay. And I had a choice between a filling, a crown or an extraction. Not knowing what was best, I asked my dentist what his suggestion was and he said in pretty clear terms, definitely an extraction. But he reminded me that it was my choice. A few moments later, while my mouth was held open with pliers trying to yank my tooth out, I thought about how powerless I felt in that situation. I mean, I couldn't leave the chair now that it had begun. But also, given the recommendation to extract, what was I going to say? No, Mr. Dentist, I reject your decades of experience. But then he did give me a choice. So you could argue that in a way, he was the powerless one. If his patients refuse treatment, there's nothing he can really do. We're the customers after all. Power relations are everywhere. And are what we're going to be looking at in these next few psychology lessons. First, as usual, some key definitions. So a person is said to have power if they can influence the thoughts or behavior of others. A person's status is their position in a group and a group is defined as two or more people who interact over a period of time, have influence on each other and share a common goal. As we saw from before, there are different types of power that someone can have over another. The dentist had some power over me, but so did I over him. Social psychologists suggest that there are six types of power. There's the power you might have if you have a reward that the other person wants. So for example, the judge in a competition has power if they get to decide who the winner is. There's the power you might have if you're able to punish, like a teacher keeping students in after class if they've misbehaved. There's power you can have simply because you know more than others do. If you have privileged or secret information, such as finding out what your opposing team's strategy is. Then there's power that was legitimately given to you because of your position in an organization, for example, or how the police have some rightful authority over citizens. There's power that my dentist had over me because he had years of experience and expert knowledge in an area that I didn't. And finally, an interesting form of power, referent power, the power that comes from being respected or admired. People might be more likely to do what you say because they look up to you. Of course, many of these work together, and it's not uncommon for people to have many types of power over someone else, which can often lead to dangerous outcomes. One of the most famous or infamous examples of power relationships, particularly in groups, comes from a study conducted by Haney, Bands and Zimbardo, which many people now refer to as the Stanford Prison Experiment. With an extremely questionable methodology and highly disturbing results, the Stanford Prison Experiment has been the subject of many commentaries, documentaries, and recently a feature film. Good afternoon, gentlemen. This experiment will be an extension of my research into the effects prisons can have on human behavior. You're going to be pleased to know that you all have been chosen to be the prison guards. But under no circumstances whatsoever, you to physically assault the prisoners in any way. So remember, just as you were watching the prisoners, my graduate staff and I will be watching you. All right, gentlemen, we gonna have ourselves a lot of fun. Rule number one, prisoners must remain silent. This is an exercise period. Okay, is it just me, or are these guys taking this thing a bit too seriously? Why don't you give me 20 push-ups? Look at this guy. He thinks he's John Wayne or something. You address me as Mr. Correctional Officer. This might be an interesting two weeks after all. Why don't you make up your bunk, 8612? I did, Mr. Correctional Officer. Well, that's not what I see. Hey, what are you doing here? Just me now! What was that? You just hit him. You're not supposed to hit him. So what happened in the original experiment? Well, 18 participants were obtained via an ad in the university paper for a paid volunteer experiment and screened for good health and mental stability. Those randomly allocated as prisoners were mock arrested by the actual police, handcuffed and taken out of their homes, first to an actual jail, then to the basement of the psychology department at Stanford University. The guards were given military style uniforms and reflective sunglasses to disguise their individuality and were told to impose their will on the prisoners using psychological intimidation. They were in full control of the prisoners, but could not physically hurt them. 
The prisoners were given smocks to wear, no underwear, and a chain around their ankles. They were told to obey all instructions from the guards and could only refer to themselves by their prison number, not their name. It will later be said that this process of de-individuation was crucial in making the participants more likely to behave very differently from how they would on their own. Guards had few inhibitions with making hard decisions and the prisoners had a greatly reduced sense of self. The experiment was designed to take place over two weeks. Prisoners were three to a cell and kept to a routine stricter than most prisons. They were blindfolded whenever they had to use the bathroom and often violently woken in the middle of the night just to attend roll call. Guards worked eight hour shifts and often administered punishments to the prisoners, such as push-ups or having to perform humiliating acts. Dr. Zimbardo, one of the researchers, played the role of the prison superintendent overseeing the actions of the guards. He will later regret playing that role in the experiment because of the way it muddied his involvement. Things went smoothly on day one, as everyone adjusted to their roles. But on the second day, the prisoners protested and rebelled, causing the guards to spray them with fire extinguishers. From then on, things just got worse. The guards gave better treatment to those they labeled the good prisoners, causing the prisoners to start doubting each other and thinking some might be informers. The guards also grew in their levels of harassment, to the point of refusing to allow prisoners to use the normal toilet, and instead a bucket in their cells, which they sometimes wouldn't even empty. It's worth mentioning that some guards were a bit nicer to the prisoners, while others said they were just following the rules of the experiment, but some were definitely just thinking of new ways to humiliate the prisoners. From day three, some prisoners began to suffer severe emotional distress, sometimes resulting in physical ailments. Initially, they weren't even allowed to leave, but eventually the experimenters figured they might have gone too far and allowed them to withdraw. Dr. Zimbardo and his colleagues also started to realize by watching CCTV footage that some guards were abusing prisoners even more at night when they thought no one was watching. On day six, the project was abandoned, less than halfway through the planned timeline. The Stanford Prison Experiment is a sad but often cited example of the effect that power and status can have in groups. Remember that these university students were all randomly allocated their roles, yet based solely on the power and status assigned to them, they not only complied with the instructions given, but took it way further than the experimenters intended. All this, despite knowing it wasn't even a real jail, nor were they real guards or real prisoners. Admittedly, there is some debate as to the participation of the experimenters themselves. Some have suggested that they encourage the guards to act in more toxic ways than they would have naturally. We'll explore this concept of obedience more in the next lesson. But suffice to say, the experiment showed us that the power of a group is very strong. It also cast a spotlight on the importance of ethics in psychological research. Some participants still reported negative effects decades after the event. Thankfully, some good came out of it too. Soon after, a government review was made on the way youth detention was carried out in the US. One of the participants even changed courses afterwards to become a forensic psychologist to work on ways to improve jail conditions for prisoners in the United States. It's a confronting study, but I want to end with the words of Dr. Zimbardo himself, who, since conducting the experiment, has worked hard to make known what he believes are crucial findings from psychology research that could improve society. Reflecting on similar examples to the prison experiment, he says, The line between good and evil is permeable. Any of us can move across it. There will come a time in your life when you have the power within you, as an ordinary person, to blow the whistle, to take action, to go the other direction and do the heroic thing. The line between good and evil lies at the center of every human heart. And with that, we conclude this lesson. <laughs>